one point, my father looked out the window of the cattle car and he read the name of the station, Auschwitz. And we didn't know what it meant. No one did. We had the honor to tour and film at the Auschwitz exhibit not long ago, not far away. It's actually the most comprehensive exhibit all about the Auschwitz camp. And we wanna share our love for the Jewish people with you guys by honoring the memory of those who died in the Holocaust and by giving you guys the opportunity to experience this world-class exhibit. It happened, therefore it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. It can happen and it can happen everywhere. So in Schindler's List, if you remember, the movie uh, is done in black and white mm. up to this point, but then you have this young girl who is in color and red in particular sticks out. So they've done a similar thing with the shoes. When the Russian soldiers reached the barbed wire, they did not greet us, nor did they smile. They seemed depressed, not only by compassion, but by confused restraint, which sealed their lips and bound their eyes to the funereal scene. It was that shame that the just man experiences at another man's crime, the feeling of guilt that such a crime should exist, that should have been introduced irrevocably into the world of things that exist. This desk belonged to Alphonse Haberfeld, a Jewish man who ran a brewery in the town of Auschwitz. While he and his wife had traveled to America, Germany invaded Poland. They never saw their daughter or their parents again. 130 year old business. It's just changed overnight. That's, that's crazy. This prayer shawl belonged to Solomon Kreiser, who was born in a small town near Auschwitz and was murdered in Auschwitz in 1942. I didn't realize that Auschwitz was such a Jewish community before yeah. the war. That That's hitting me right now on mm. how, like, where the horror happened was actually a majority Jewish community. It's a proclamation that was made in 1554 that demanded that Jews wear a symbol to differentiate them from Christians. That proclamation was given to Hermann Goring as a birthday present in 1940. And so it's just this setup of anti-Semitism through the centuries. I didn't realize that even in 1551 there was that amount of anti-Semitism. I mean, even just in seed form. And then it was celebrated in 1940 by that birthday gift. That's just sickening. They're just painting the picture of anti-Semitism in a really, I mean, in a, in a really profound way, so. Wow. There's one quote that was really uh, impactful. He says this, I, I begin with the young. We older ones are used up, we are rotten to the marrow, but my magnificent youngsters, it's just, it's just so gross, mm. it's disgusting. Are there any finer ones in the world? What material? With them, I can make a new world. I mean, there's just so many things wrong with that, <laughs> but it's the it's this like false opposite of you know, what the Lord wants and what the Lord desires. And because the Lord desires this generational transfer and mm. generational blessing. And I mean, it was just a, a twist, a disgusting right. twist of how he saw the the, the way to shape the nation, you know, through manipulating 
the right. youth, and it was just that's just horrible. There was this other quote that that stuck out to me big time. As a pastor, this is from a German pastor, for they came first for the communist and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the social Democrats and I did not speak out because I was not a social Democrat. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. There was an opportunity for this German pastor to, to speak out against injustice and against you know, the, the biblical things that were uh, right and true and speaking out against the things that were not in line with biblical principles. And what he was left with was being alone because he didn't speak up. It's like about people. Yeah. You know, it's right. like he's saying, I didn't stand with these people, yeah. not principles. Humans. I didn't stand with these humans. Right. I didn't stand with these humans. Mm -hmm. And finally, this evil will come after this human. I think you know, as humans, we have this deep self-preservation DNA. And so when you read something like that, you realize the, the necessity of the other mm. and how if we don't take care of the our neighbors we don't love our neighbors uh, what it can lead to There are now two sorts of countries in the world, those that want to expel the Jews and those that don't want to admit them. This woman was just talking about the expulsion of the Jewish people and everything that was happening in Europe during the, this time. And she was saying what surprised us was not the way our enemies acted, but the way our friends acted. That just hit me. So, I mean, you'd think your friends would stand with you in times of crisis. And that wasn't the story. So, wow, to have the whole world turn on you like that. There's another quote over there, but you know, he gave his name, he had his name, and then he was given a number when he checked in. And for four or five years, he never used his name, just the number. And so just seeing the pictures and the other numbers plus their name. These are humans, beautiful humans. They lit Sabbath candles on the cattle cars. <laughs> I don't know how they did that. Wow. Makes you look at the Sabbath candles a little bit differently. picture of Anne Frank and 
who was in hiding, and then who were the helpers. You look at the picture from right here, you can't tell who's Jewish and who's not Jewish. You just look at it. I don't know why that's sticking out to me, but just like. All the Nazis were so into this blood, this pure bloodline, this Aryan race thing, fueled by pseudoscience. In September 1944, the sound of a shofar was heard in the auschwitz monowitz satellite camp. In January 1945, during the death march from Auschwitz, an unidentified prisoner who was very sick gave the shofar to Kaskel Tidor. With great difficulty, he kept the shofar until he was liberated on April 11, 1945. On Rosh Hashanah 1945, he blew the shofar on board the ship taking him to Israel, and he blew that shofar every Rosh Hashanah until his death in 1993. In 1940, Mendel Landau was sent to the first of many forced labor camps. One day he met a Hungarian Jew who had just arrived in the camp and who had not yet been stripped of his civilian clothing. Landau noticed the man's tzitzis and asked if he could borrow the talit so he could make a blessing. Later, an SS guard spotted Mendel wearing the tzitzis, beat him viciously, and threw the now bloodied talit katan on a heap of trash near the camp fence. When the guard had moved on, Landau risked his life for a second time, now to retrieve the Tali Katan for its owner. But the man did not want it, after having seen the price he had paid for its possession. At great risk, Landau held on to the Tzitzis while in Auschwitz until he was liberated from Dachau on April 28, 1945. There was this other story that really impacted me as we were going through the exhibit, and it's about this, uh, this monk. Uh, I'll just read it here. Maximilian Maria Kolbe was a Polish Franciscan monk. He was arrested on February 1941 and then deported to Auschwitz. Despite harsh punishments, if caught, he secretly continued to hear confessions and encourage others to pray. Two months after his arrival, he volunteered to take the place of another inmate, who, after trying to escape, had been sentenced with nine others to death by starvation. Hmm. I mean, it's it's... It's incredible to hear this story hmm. of one person taking the place of another. Hmm. Somebody that he didn't even know. That's the that's a way of Messiah. That, that greater love has no one than this. Than a hmm. man lay down his life for his friend, let alone for someone he doesn't even know. Right. That's loving your neighbor at the highest, highest level. possible level. Yeah. I could only thank him with my eyes. I was stunned and could hardly grasp what was going on. The immensity of it. I, the condemned and to live, and someone else willingly and voluntarily offers his life for me, a stranger? Is this some dream? And we need people like him in our generation now. Right. True Christians. Yeah. True, devout followers of Jesus. Right. To the end. We're so grateful that we had the opportunity to go through this exhibit and we highly recommend if you're in the Kansas City area or if you're anywhere near to go to their website and buy tickets. You can click on the link in the description below to get more information for that. Yeah, many people don't know that there are still thousands of Holocaust survivors alive today in the land of Israel. And we are close friends with an amazing ministry in Israel called Hatikva Project and they actually give free dental care mm -hmm. to Holocaust survivors. So they're an amazing ministry and they do it all in the name of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and these are our friends, and so they're trustworthy, and you can fully get behind them. So if you'd like to support uh, Holocaust survivors and Jewish people in the land of Israel, uh, we highly recommend Hatikva Project.